Hi, my name is Mark Dillinger, and uh, I'm from Central Indiana. And uh, you can find me on Facebook at M.A. Dillinger Wood Carvings. Uh, you can also find my Etsy shop uh, also under the name of M.A. Dillinger Carving uh, on Instagram uh, at Dillinger163. And uh, we would like to welcome you to the International Association of Wood Carving. Oh, he's wrote it down now. And I wrote it down now. Okay. You can't read it. <laughs> Last time, go. Okay, you ready? Hi, my name is Mark Dillinger from Central Indiana. Uh, you can find me on Facebook at M.A. Dillinger Wood Carvings. Uh, you can also find my M.A. Dillinger Carving. And my Instagram is Dillinger163. Uh, we would like to welcome you to today's uh, edition of the International Association of Wood Carvers. All right, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the International Association of Woodcarvers. Uh, today is May the 13th, 2023, and uh, we welcome you all into our meeting this afternoon. Uh, I want to start off by thanking Dave Levy for uh, covering for me last week. Uh, I have a daughter who just turned 18, getting ready to graduate on Saturday, or I'm sorry, on Friday, and uh, I've been tied up with uh, graduation stuff uh proms and things like that so uh i apologize for missing last week and uh again i want to thank dave for filling in he's always really good to make sure that meet these meetings continue without a hitch so uh thank you all for uh joining us and uh thanks for joining us today uh today on our meeting we got a special guest uh mark dillinger that's going to be coming into us from indiana uh we'll talk a little bit more about mark here in just a few minutes i want to tell you all before we get started what we have coming up um, we are ending our weekly series, uh, this month in May, um, because it's starting to warm up outside and, uh, a lot of people have activities that they do during the summer. Um, we drop back to a summer series for June, July, and August. Uh, so we're going to have some great presenters that we have lined up for those three months, but we're only going to do a, uh, a monthly meeting during, uh, June, July, and August. Uh, and then we'll go back to our weekly meeting starting in September. Uh, but uh, let me tell you a little bit about what we have uh, this coming up weekend and next weekend uh, for the uh, for the May meetings. We've got Lucas Cost, uh, who's been on with us before. He does some realistic type carvings, uh, a lot of cottonwood bark stuff. He'll be coming in on the 20th of May. Uh, we've got Reese from Woody Wood Spirits that's going to be coming in. He's uh, he's overseas and he's going to be joining us on the 27th. Uh, that'll round out our weekly series. Uh, in June, we've got Jeff May, who is a, um, he's a phenomenal uh, chainsaw carver. Uh, he's going to be talking to us a little bit about what he has been doing. He's doing some carving and stuff out on a boat, which is interesting to hear. Uh, he's going to be talking about that and uh, hopefully doing a demonstration in June. Uh, in July, Randall Stoner, who's the mad carver, he's going to be coming in uh, and talking to us about his process. Uh, that's on July the 20th, or I'm sorry, July the 15th. And then in August, I talked to Rich Smithson this morning. Uh, he wants to come back in. And again, that's Rich Smithson from Healthy Knives. He's going to be doing the meeting August 26th. Uh, he's going to be uh, sharpening three different knives, and he's going to auction those three knives in that meeting. Uh, and it's going to be a set. So uh, that'll be something inter interesting to see. And we're always excited to have Rich and Holly in with us. So they'll be joining us on August the 26th. I um, want to tell you a little bit about some uh, workshops that are available for people who uh, may be looking for classes to take this summer but don't want to travel. Um, I know Dell Green has a class that's going to be starting May the 20th. I think that sign up uh, has already closed. Uh, hopefully you got in on that. Uh, he's going to be doing caricature dogs starting May 20th. Uh, Janet Cordell, who is a phenomenal carver, uh, she's going to be doing a female bus carving uh, class on uh, June the 2nd. Uh, and then Dave Stetson, who's in our meeting today, uh, he'll start a class on June the 3rd on carving uh, caricature heads. Uh, so if you get a chance, reach out to these instructors, get signed up. Make sure you go out on Wood Carving Academy and check out their offerings. Again, they have uh, classes that have been recorded in the past that are available. Uh, you can sign up for subscriptions out there and get some great instruction 
Uh, you can work at your own pace. Again, I think the, Iran has one month, three month, and a year subscription. Uh, it's very worth the fee that they charge to go out and see these videos, uh, learn from some of the best instructors out there. So uh, check out Wood Carving Academy if you get a chance. Um, as far as some of the things going up this are going on this summer, uh, there's a lot of shows and stuff that's going on. The first one I'll talk about is this one that's here behind me. Uh, the CCA will be doing another show September 23rd, 24th. Uh, it's the only caricature show in the United States that's strictly about caricature carving. Uh, it's uh, called Carving the Rockies. Uh, if you get a chance, go out to that. I'll be broadcasting live from out there. I think Dave Levy's going to join me down there. Uh, and we're going to uh, bring the show to anybody that's not able to make it live. But we would much rather you come in and join us there at the show. Come over and say hello and uh, participate in the show. Uh, it's a really good time. Again, September 23rd, 24th. So try to join us out there if you get a chance. Uh, there's, um, let's see, Hill and Holler Wood Carvings doing a show out in Missouri. Van Kelly talked a little bit about that. Uh, that's on August 10th and 10th through the 12th. Uh, the Northwest Carving Academy has a show that's coming up in July. Uh, that's out in Washington State. That's July 10th through the 14th. Uh, so, again, there's a lot of great things that you can participate in and get involved in. Uh, look for those local shows uh, and uh, make sure you participate in those. Uh, as far as the Wood Carving Academy, somebody's already put a question in the chat. The Wood Carving Academy is actually ran by um, Yaron Yadidia, I think I pronounced that right. I'm not sure. Not great with pronouncing names. Um, but some of the instructors that are on Wood Carving Academy are CCA members. Uh, again, you can go out and check that out, see what's available without actually enrolling. So I encourage you to go to woodcarvingacademy.com and check all that out. Uh, today, again, on our meeting, we have uh, Mark Dillinger. Uh, he's coming to us from Indiana. He's going to be talking to us a little bit about his carving process. Uh, he's going to show us kind of step by step what he does when he does his carvings. He has a very unique style. A lot of people will recognize that when they see his work. Uh, he also has a carving and a deep holler knife that he's going to uh, auction off during this meeting. So uh, when uh, he comes on, he'll talk a little bit about that. The auction as normal will happen in the chat during the meeting. Uh, so you can pay, place your bids down there. Uh, the highest bid will win. So at the end of the meeting, we'll call that. Uh, the person that wins the, the auction needs to stay online so we can gather your information, get your payment. Uh, but I'll let, uh, let Mark talk a little bit more about what he's offering up. Again, all proceeds for the auctions go to the International Association of Woodcarvers. Uh, we continue to have to pay for these Zoom subscriptions so that we can have these meetings. Um, so we appreciate all the help and, uh, you know, the people that participate in the auctions by merchandise. And again, before the meeting, we were joking a little bit about all of that. Uh, we have merchandise that's available. I don't know if you all know about that, but it's available uh, for you to go out and purchase. Uh, we do make a little bit of a profit off of those uh, that goes back into paying for these meeting subscriptions. Uh, I'll put the link of that for that down in the chat. If anybody wants to go out and look at the merchandise, they can go out there. Uh, and see if there's something that interests you. Again, uh, Dave Stetson and Bob Hershey has the newest uh, shirt that I've made and put out there available. And having said all that, we'll go ahead and get started with the meeting. Uh, check out the shirts and you'll see what I'm talking about. Mark, I appreciate you coming in today. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Mark Dillinger. Uh, appreciate you coming on and sharing with us. And I look forward to hearing what you have, have to share today. Good afternoon, everybody. I want to say thanks to Blake and Dave for allowing me to be a part of this. I'm going to go ahead and jump right in with the auction items. Uh, we're going to be doing a little hobo here uh, on a little display. And uh, remember, the auction is not about me. It's this is all about helping out uh, the International Wood Carpet Association. Along with that, we're also going to be auctioning off a deep holler knife. Uh, it's just a, it's got an a handle. Uh, it's got kind of a crescent moon handle shape to it. And it's a one and a half inch blade. Uh, I was fortunate enough to, uh, to be able to partner with Deep Holler uh, a few months ago and uh, to help kind of try to supply uh, 
knives to new carvers and local carvers. So that's kind of what we're uh, all about there. Uh, so once again, we're going to be auctioning off uh, this hobo and this knife. Uh, anybody has any questions about those, feel free to go ahead and ask. But go ahead and just uh, kind of kind of just do a little bit of talking before we get into anything. And just kind of give my my start and my background in carving. Uh, I started, I think it was around 1999, one year my wife asked me what I wanted for Christmas. And uh, we had been to Gatlinburg and I had uh, went through the artist loop and we had seen uh, some wood carvers there. And I remember, I, I don't think the guy's there anymore, uh, but he had carved these, uh, I, I guess, folk style birds. Uh, looking back now, I'd say they, they were kind of rough, but I fell in love with the ideal of being able to do that with a piece of wood. So uh, I told her, hey, I'm going to become a wood carver. Buy me a Dremel for Christmas. And uh, she did that. And uh, I started out carving fish. I carved fish for probably two or three years before I carved anything else. And uh, once I got the, uh, the Dremel for Christmas that morning, I went out to the barn and I found a piece of wood. And I was telling telling Blake and Dave this the other night we were talking. I started out with probably about a 10 or 12 inch piece of wood. And when I got uh, finished, uh, by the time I kept breaking fins off and having to uh, start over again, uh, I ended up with this little thing. And uh, I remember when I got there, I thought, man, I have finally arrived. I, I finished something up and uh, I took that uh, carving out to my dad's house to show him. And uh, uh, he, he's a woodworker and he has a he has a full blown uh, workshop with all the saws and the uh, planers and all that. And it just so happened that uh, his neighbor across the fence was over there that day. And uh, uh, I didn't know it. I mean, I had grown up next to him and I moved away when I was 17 and he had retired and he got into wood carving. And he says, if you got time, I want you to come over and look at my shop. So he took me over there. And uh, I was just amazed at the things that he had. And one of the things that he had that I didn't have uh, was, was a Murphy knife. And he gave me one of those little Murphy knives. He said, hey, take this home and play with it. So I did. And uh, I worked on fish for, for quite a while during that time frame. And when I would get one done, I would take it back to him. And uh, so I ended up with a fish that looked something like this. Uh, at, at least we kept the length to it. And uh, I, the next trip there, uh, his, his name was Delmer Taylor. And Delmer looks at me and he says, OK, now we got to introduce something new. And he gave me a set of, uh, of gouges to play with. I still have uh, that set of gouges. Uh, he passed away a few years ago and I was able to purchase his carving knives and his V tools and uh, all of his hand tools. And I have them in my shop. Uh, but I don't use any of them. I, I just kept them out of respect for him. Uh, I keep them maintained uh, uh, and, and make sure that they're they're upkept. Uh, but I don't use those tools. Uh, it's just one of those things I wanted to have as a, as a personal memento from him. Uh, then the next trip back, he introduced me to the thought of having to paint. He says, if you're going to wood carve, you got to paint. And I, I'm like, man, I'm not a painter. I don't know how to paint. And he told me, you know, go get you some acrylic paint and uh, some brushes and, and have at it. Uh, that was kind of his training. It wasn't, uh, you got to do it this way or you got to do it that way. He would lead me in the direction and, and, and give me enough information to where I could identify uh, what tools or what uh, equipment I needed. And I ended up with uh, this fish. And this was my first uh, painted fish. And uh, I, I worked on, as I said, I painted, I, I carved fish for a long time. And uh, you, you want to hand me that one over there? Uh, I, I kept at it. And this is the only, uh, only finished fish that I have left uh, from carving basically with a knife and a set of hand tools. And I've done several bluegills and bass and things through the years. And uh, they've all either been given away or sold uh, to someone. And uh, that's the only one I kept for myself. And uh, a lot of times when people will talk to me, they'll talk to me about my style of carving. I'm always asked, you know, what, what style of carving do you have? 
And uh, usually I respond with uh, uh, the answer. Uh, I have a jacked up style. And the reason I say that is, is because it's a combination of several individuals. And uh, uh, having been self-taught, and when I say that, I want to make it perfectly clear, that's not bragging rights. That's, uh, I, I'm going to talk a little bit later on about uh, clubs and shows and, and the importance of those. I think when you're self-taught, you can teach yourself a lot of bad things. Uh, so that's why I strongly encourage people to take the classes when they can, attend all the shows you can, talk to carvers, uh, talk to people who know what to do, uh, and you can save yourself a lot of, a lot of grief and, and heartache down the road. Uh, but as I began to, to continue to do this, uh, my wife and I went through a uh, cutback on our jobs, and I thought, well, I'm going to have to get a second job or something. And instead of doing that, I decided, well, I'm going to go ahead and try to start selling some of my work. And that's how I got into Etsy. Uh, it wasn't uh, just a desire to, to just do it. Uh, it was kind of out of necessity, and that's what I ended up doing. And at that time, I the only thing I, I had that was really my own was Cardinal on the Corner uh, characters. Uh, I made up my mind uh, when I was going to start selling on Etsy. Uh, one of the things that I would not do would be sell other people's work. Uh, I wasn't going to buy rough outs from people and carve them and sell them. Uh, I wasn't going to take a, a book and, and use their patterns to do it. I wanted to come up with something that was my own. And I got to thinking a lot about that. And I recalled a, uh, a video that I watched one time that Lynn Dottie was putting on. And in that video, he said something that stuck out at me. And I remember it, uh, probably not word for word, but uh, back when he was just saturating the uh, internet with his videos on how to carve, uh, I was following along one day on it. And, and he made a statement that, that I think was one of the best statements I've heard. He says, it's okay if you learn to carve like me, learn all you can. But he goes, at some point, you got to ask yourself, do you want to be known as someone that can carve like Lynn Dotty? Or do you want to be able for people to say, hey, that's that guy's carving? And so uh, I set out to try to achieve that. And if people ask me, well, how do you develop your style? I can't tell you. It's just something that comes together uh, over a period of time. Uh, I was fortunate enough uh, to end up getting a, a style that's unique. Uh, if I had to answer the question seriously, I would say it's more of a folk art uh, style of carving. Uh, not, uh, it's not flat plane. A lot of people go, well, you're a flat plane carver, but I'm not. Uh, I, I do a lot of long cuts. I do a lot of deep cuts, uh, but I'm not flat plane. I've tried to carve flat plane. Uh, I've tried to follow Gene Messer videos and, and I have a couple of jeans carvings and I kid you not, it's, I'm, I'm probably the worst flat plane carver on the face of the earth. Uh, I, I love Johnny O's stuff and I've tried to look at it and it, it's just like, it's just not there. And I don't know if any of you guys run into that or not. It's just, sometimes you just don't connect with something. Well, I really connected with, uh, the little guys that I'm working on. And, uh, before I show you how that, how that, uh, progressed. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and show you the first one I started with. Uh, this is what I came up with. And uh, these were all done basically with just a knife. Uh, years ago, uh, I, I, I met uh, uh, Don Mertz at the Dayton show, and he talked a lot about carving with a knife. You all know that he's known for basically carving everything uh, pretty much with a knife. And I did that for a long time. My guys were real blocky, and when I got to enough of them manufactured or produced or whatever, carved out uh, to put on, uh, to, to open up my store, I had to come up with something to call them, and uh, I said, well, I'll just call these things block hits, because they're really blocky. I start with a blocked out head, and I thought that was really, really the way to go, and I decided I was going to send out three carvings to people I knew that carved and carved well, carved better than I did, and uh, sent them the whole package, the presentation, the package, uh, the business card, uh, the thank you note, all of that. I just wanted them to give me some feedback uh, on my presentation, and uh, I got feedback immediately uh, from two out of the three guys, and they asked me, hey, did you get this idea from Steve Prescott? Because Steve did a book called 
uh, carving blockheads. And I go, no, I, I don't even know who you're talking about. Uh, that's how ignorant I was in carving and how isolated I was because I was self-taught and didn't branch out into clubs and things like that. And uh, it's funny. It's a funny story. And I tell this story all the time. About two days after I listed my first carvings as blockheads, I got a friend re request on Facebook from Steve Prescott. I remember sitting there looking across the, the living room from my rock, my recliner, and I was on Facebook, and I looked at my wife, and I said, man, I think I might be in trouble. And she goes, why? And I said, well, these guys asked me about this guy, and now he's wanting to be my friend on Facebook. And uh, so I, I, I got to talking with him, and, and I told him, hey, you know, I didn't know about your books. I didn't know any of this stuff. I'm not trying to copy you or anything like that. And uh, Steve says, you know what? The book's probably out of print. I'm not worried about it, blah, blah, blah. And, but then he says, you know, Mark, he says, the only thing I'm concerned with is that you'll always be recognized by my name, by Steve Prescott Blockheads. He goes, that's my only concern is that you will get lost in that. He goes, but if you want to use the name or whatever, I said, hey, look, I won't. I, I'll find something different to call them. Uh, so they became everyday people. Uh, I have to share that because I think Steve Prescott's probably one of the nicest guys I ever talked to in carving. And it wasn't long uh, after that that he passed. Uh, you meet so so many great people in carving. I, I think that's the greatest thing about wood carving for me. It's not as I love to carve and I carve every day, but it's the people that I get it to meet, friendships that we get to develop. Well, as my carving uh, continued to grow and, and it began, continued to expand, uh, there were things that made it change. Uh, I, I, I try to attend the Buckeye uh, Roundup uh, in Ohio each year uh, over there. And one year, Dwayne Gosnell was going to be there. And I'd seen Dwayne on, on Facebook, and I really wanted to try to, to carve something uh, with him. I had never carved a rough out before. And I remember asking him, Dwayne, I've never carved a, a rough out. What would you suggest? And I'll never forget his answer. His answer was, well, if you want something simple, grab a, grab a bear, knock the edges off and put a few, few hairs on it. He goes, and you'll have, you'll have what you want. But if you want to get into something more detailed, then pick uh, something that's got some facial expression. So we did. And uh, I still have that. Dwayne carved most of that carving during that session. Uh, and it was really neat because he would stop in the middle of, of, of showing me something and, and hold it up and talk to everybody uh, that was in the, in, the, in the roundup. And he would hold it up. And uh, I have that aside. And I still refer back to it occasionally. Uh, I mentioned him because it was through him that I learned how I wanted to carve hands. Now, my hands don't look like hands, and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to name some other people here, uh, and I use their techniques. Uh, I'm not copying theirs, and if you see mine, you'll understand uh, that I'm not copying. I'm just using the techniques that they use. Uh, so I got my hands from him. Uh, then uh, I caught a, a video by Dave Stetson. Uh, I think it was like a five or ten minute bottle topper he was putting on uh, on Facebook, and uh I had struggled for a long time with how how I did my ears. And I didn't like them. And like a lot of carvers, uh, you end up carving everything with long hair and not, and not having any ears. But I didn't want to stay there. Uh, so I I adapted his, uh, his, his technique in that video to do my ears. And that's how I ended up with, with adding those ears to what I was already doing. So we've changed two things since my beginning, and one was the hands and one was the ears. Uh, I, I decided that I, I didn't like the way I was doing my noses, so I just went out and I kept uh, playing around, and I just carved nose after nose after nose. I like, if you haven't noticed, uh, I'm going to pull up the carving here. I like big noses. I, I, I just It's just one of the things that's part of my... Uh, I guess style is the big nose. Uh, and so I've, that's one thing that I have not changed once I got there. Uh, then as I got more involved online and then I joined uh, uh, the Wood Carving Illustrated Forum back years ago when the forum was uh, the place to be. And I met a lot of carvers there. Uh, I met a guy, many of you may remember him, named Forrest Holder. Uh, he was online as the Tennessee artist. 
and 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 Force and I became friends, and I would talk to him. Uh, if you know, if you knew him, you knew that he was was fighting cancer and heart problems and things. And uh, one day, just out of the blue, in a conversation, he says, "Mark, I like what you're doing, but I think your painting might look a little better if you would do this or you would do that." And he began to help me. And it's his techniques and style that that I have adapted as far as my my painting. And then uh, some of you may know a guy by the name of Tom Ellis out of uh, <clears throat> where's he at out of Washington. And uh, he uh, we became friends through uh, wood carving illustrated, and we've swapped carvings and tools and things and back and forth and. and uh, if he works on something new, a lot of times he'll show me or I'll show him. And, and Tom was one of the guys that I picked to send one of my first carvings to. And uh, I give Tom credit for the junk in the trunk. Uh, one thing that was one thing that he told me, he says, you really got to work on the junk in the trunk. And he says, you got to put you got to learn to put your creases in and you got to You got to learn how to create a rear end on a guy. You know, he says 90 percent of the people out there don't just have a flat a flat back side and increases in the clothes and all that. And then Tom also taught me a very valuable lesson one time. Uh, I had worked forever on this large Santa and I got it done and I was so proud of it. And I posted it on the wood carving illustrated and Tom sends me a message that simply said, did you count his fingers? And I went and counted them, and it's like, okay, he's got five fingers. Yeah, he's got five fingers. And I did it over and over and over and over. Then it hit me, okay, he's got five fingers and a thumb. So I count my fingers every time I carve now. Uh, I, I don't know if any of you ever have that. Uh, now, when I say that, it doesn't mean that I won't do a carving that only has three fingers or what have you, uh, depending on what I'm doing. I just adapt to it. Uh, that's kind of kind of my style is, is I just carve and whatever comes up, comes up. But, uh, and then a few years ago, I had hand surgery and uh, I couldn't carve for a long time. And uh, when I got back into carving, I decided, hey, I've got to change some things up. So I had to learn how to hold the wood completely different than I did. And uh, you wouldn't think something as simple as just changing the way you have to hold wood would affect your uh, technique or your your style, but it did. Uh, then I went, I, I went from carving everything with just a knife. I started using a lot of V-tools and gouges, and that took a lot of the sharpness out of, of the carvings that I'd started with and uh, ended up going that direction. Uh, so as far as, as far as how my style has developed, I'm going to ask you guys if we can go ahead and switch over to the iPad, and uh, I'm going to kind of take you through the journey of how things have uh, changed through the years, as I showed earlier, this is one of the first ones I did. And I had someone tell me, hey, you need to quit carving on the corner because you can get uh, you can get so much more out of it if you carve the other direction. Well, I did a few like that. Uh, but then I decided, you know what, I'm going to take it as a challenge. I'm going to see how much stuff I can cram into a carving on the corner. And it really took it as a challenge and I uh, decided I was going to try to see how much I could put in. So uh, I used to do six inch carvings all the time, but as I began to try to want to put more and more things in, uh, I realized I need a little bit more wood to work with. So I went from a two by two uh, by six to a two by two by seven. So almost everything I carve is that in that uh, block range uh, to where I ended up with uh, a guy like this one right here. And, and that's pretty much where my style has stayed uh, for the most part. And then when COVID came out, you remember when uh, Bart Wilson was doing the uh, Fun Day Sundays? Uh, I would follow along and did. I, I can't remember if he what, if he did a clown or what it was, but I took his his pattern that that he gave everyone to carve, and I went to work and I stretched it out and elongated it and shrunk it down to where it would fit into my my block of wood where I'm comfortable carving in in the smaller blocks. And I came up with this style here, and, and uh, I've done a few like that. If you ever get one of those from me, you're going to see on the bottom of it, it, it will be numbered, but it will have a BW in front of it representing Bart Wilson because that's technically his pattern. Uh, each year, as uh, things go on, I became known as the person that would carve 
uh, basically uh, large projects. And uh, as I started selling things, I had people contact me and ask me to buy things. And uh, I, I did a, uh, my first series was uh, biblical characters for, for a, a young Jewish rabbi. He was putting together a uh, library for his children. And uh, it was only going to be like five carvings and it ended up being 30. And then from there, I, I was contacted by an individual to do a bunch of smoke jumpers. And we did about 30 of those. And then uh, last year, I did a bunch of construction workers. And then uh, for me personally, I, I've carved all the presidents of the United States uh, up through uh, Trump. I haven't got our current president carved yet, uh, but uh, I need to get him fi finished so we can get the, uh, uh, the set up to date. And then I did a, uh, a group of the Civil War. I'm a Civil War buff. I like to read uh, about the Civil War. And I decided I'm going to just do all the generals of the Civil War. Uh, as I can started that project, I realized there was a lot of generals in the Civil War, so I had to just stop it off at some point, and I did that. So each year for our carving show at the Rain Tree County, uh, Rain, Rain Tree uh, Wood Carvers uh, in Mount Summit, I try to come up with a different theme, a unique theme uh, that's different than what I had done the year before. Uh, so this year I decided I'm, I'm not really a Santa carver. Uh, per se. Uh, but this year I decided, okay, I've not done anything Christmas. So I want to go with a Christmas theme. I'm going to go ahead and have her scan uh, all the different Santas that were, that I'm working on. <coughs> uh, probably, I think it's five different cutouts. And if anybody's interested in, in getting patterns or whatever, they're very basic. Let me tell you, I don't do a lot of rough out carving, uh, but this is my this is my cutout for all of this style, and as you can see, if you have the if you have the uh, the block head, you can you can turn that however you want. Uh, I went to the extreme with the Russian Santa, tried to get the flowing in the beard and all that. Uh, you can have them tilted just a little bit, and so forth. Then I went on to some of the larger ones, uh, and this is the the block out or the cutout that I used for it. And it takes care of all these different ones. Even some of the smaller ones in the back came out of that. I ran into a batch of wood. I buy all of my, my wood at uh, Northwest Lumber in Indianapolis. And they have good wood. But one of the last pieces that I bought ended up having uh, a mineral run right through the center of it, about two feet in from each end. And I didn't realize it until I got into it. So... Uh, if you jump all the way down to the end, the small sanders came out of me recutting my cutouts to get rid of uh, the minerals, the mineral line that was in the edge of the of the wood. This is the block at, or the cutout that I use for several of the other Santas and snowmen. <coughs> snowmen are probably my least favorite things to carve. Uh, it's just a mental thing with me. Uh, I don't have anything against snowmen. It's just not something that I did a lot of. But this year, I decided I'm going to force myself uh, to do some snowman. So a lot of these Santas in the back here uh, and some of these other ones came out of this pattern. I did quite a few with the trees. And all of that, a lot of those came out of this one cutout. And I did a lot of these with the uh, the gnome and the, or the the small gnome Santa in the tree, and uh, that cutout is like this. This is just one that I found online, and uh, kind of altered it from what it was originally to what I did. Uh, what I tried to do, even though I may use the same cutout over and over and over, I tried to figure out different ways, different things to carve and paint to change them up. <clears throat> and then what I came up with this year uh, is uh, the tree hat Santa. And that's just the cutout. It's very basic. And what we find here, I've got several different ones that I've done. 
a lot of wood burning. I would burn everything that I carved. So, but pretty much everything you see here, uh, I do have one other cut out here on the top, but a lot of these other ones are just ones that I set down with a piece of wood that I found in my off cuts and decided to uh, start doing that. Uh, the trees, uh, all these trees are carved off of off cuts when I'm cutting out cutouts and things like that. Um, then down here, you can see I do carve rough outs occasionally. When we first moved in here uh, a little over a year ago, the shop wasn't set up. There was no heat. Uh, so I ended up buying uh, several rough outs to uh, be able to carve in the kitchen. You use primarily acrylic paint. Yes, uh, everything I paint is acrylic. And I water it down to various stages. Uh, sometimes I'll do it more of a wash and sometimes it's more of a weak paint. Um, I like the bright colors. Uh, I don't necessarily do quite uh, as thin of a wash as most people do. So yeah, any other questions at, that, at this point? Looks like we're good, Mark. Uh, I've asked them to unmute and ask if they have specific questions, so you may get some questions from the from the group. Okay, very good. Uh, one of the things that you'll you'll see about my carvings is that proportions is not something that I concern myself with. And I know Dave's on here. And I, I know that goes against what what he teaches, but I I think folk art allows you a little bit of liberty uh, of being able to play with things. Uh, I once got a uh, planes casting from Dave uh, and I studied that a lot and, and I, it sits up here uh, out of view on my top shelf. I can see it when I'm out here and I'll pay attention to it. And uh, a lot of times when I'm carving, I, I, I remind, I, I'm reminded, I sent Dave a carving of himself. Uh, I'm assuming that, that you got it, Dave, and you weren't offended by it. And uh I always, always in the back of my mind, I'm afraid that he starts out each of his classes saying, today we're going to learn how not to carve like this guy. Uh, but uh, I, I think that depending on what you're doing, uh, I think you you can get by with some things that you can't get by with other uh, with other styles. And uh, my arms may be a little long on one carving, and my legs may be a little bit of sh a little bit shorter. Uh, it just all depends on how it starts flowing together with me as I carve. Um, as far as uh, upcoming events, uh, the, the Buckeye Woodcarvers Roundup, uh, July 19th through the 22nd in Fletcher, Ohio. Uh, they do a really good job over there. Uh, there's some, some talented carvers that come in there. Uh, Bruce Hand, uh, you've got uh, Don Worley and, and several of the local guys from 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 that area that come in, and uh, it's a good place to come and meet guys to carve. Uh, I, I, that's probably was the first formal type setting that I had ever set in had ever set in uh, when I went to that. And uh, like I said, I got some things from Dwayne. Uh, when I carved with him, I picked up some things from Bruce Hen when I've carved with him and uh, uh, Don Worley. Uh, one thing, if I was going to change anything on my carvings, it would probably be my eyes. And uh, I, I love the way that Don does eyes. Don Worley does some of the best eyes out there. Uh, I, I keep considering about giving a piece to him up until the point where it's ready for eyes and saying, okay, what would you suggest here? And I may do that one day uh, just to see if I can maybe adapt that. Uh, I, I get worried about changing things too much because I'm afraid that I may make it not look like my carvings anymore. Uh, but I usually try to change one thing at a time. Uh, and then uh, uh, the other thing is uh, our, our local wood carving club, the Rain Tree Wood Carvers Club. Uh, we have our annual show September the 16th. Uh, I was telling Blake before uh, the meetings are in the Rockies, and there's a lot of talent coming across the country. Uh, this year, we were able to get uh, Jim Heiser to come in. He's going to do a two-day show prior to that uh, on the 14th and the 15th. 
And uh, we're also going to have Helby Knives there, uh, some other tool vendors there. And uh, if you're in the area and you're looking to pick up some stuff and see some see some good carving from just some local carvers, it's, it's a good good place. And that's a, a one day show on Saturday. Uh, and there's not any other questions at this point. Uh, hey, Mark, I think we, we do have one, one question. Um, yes. Somebody wants to know primarily um, what is your go to knife? and uh, the size, sweep, and brand of it. So do you have a specific knife you use? Sure. use? The knife that I use uh, right now, uh, all the time, it is, it's a deep hauler. It's a one and three quarter inch detail. I, until uh, for years, I have carved with nothing but detail knives. Uh, and, uh, but when I started some of the larger Santas the, and the larger pieces, uh, I did end up moving into, uh, a, a two inch rough out uh, just because it allows me the opportunity to reach over into the center of the block a little better. Uh, I love, I love up sweep knives. Uh, I do have, uh, I have several from Helby that are, are slide up sweeps. Uh, I, ha I have this one uh, that I keep in my box. Uh, it's one that Rich ha had made me uh, and uh, I use it when I need to be able to go down into the wood and come out. Uh, I use a, the flat grind uh, blades for the most part, and they work well for me. Uh, the only time I experience any kind of issue with uh, a flat grind straight knife is if I am trying to go down in and come back out. And, and I know has a lot of success doing that, but that's, uh, that's for the most part. Uh, I'm kind of a boring carver when it comes to knives. I don't have a ton of tools. Uh, I try to maintain two or three of the ones I use all the time just because, you know, things do happen. Uh, I, I've broken probably two or three knives. I'm a pretty aggressive carver. Uh, I, I don't consider myself a, a fantastic carver, uh, I, but I am very good at uh, production carving. I, I learned when I started my Etsy shop, I, I went in and I found carvers that I felt like were better than I, I was at that time and carvers that weren't quite as good as I felt like I was. And I used them for my price point. And I said, okay, in order to do this, I need to be somewhere in here. And to accomplish that, I had to learn to carve fast uh, to do that. And sometimes I think when uh, you get caught up into the production mode and stuff, one of the questions I get asked all the time is how long does it take you to carve a carving? And I think every carver in the world gets asked that. And uh, my go-to answer is always, uh, it's finished when it's finished. And uh, I, I will also normally tell people, uh, when it's finished, you need to learn how to stop. I, I'm sure every carver out there has done that. They've taken a carving, they thought, well, I'll just make one or two more cuts or I'll just do this. And you end up either cutting yourself or you end up, messing your piece up so uh that's usually what i tell people <laughs> i've been asked about uh, videos no my answer is always the same I, I don't make videos i feel like there are so many people out there more qualified than i am to that already made videos they're good videos they're instructional uh, you got the doug linkers you got uh you know the gene messers and those guys and then you have uh, the Wood Carving Academy out there that's got, you know, the best of the best on there. So uh, I don't feel like another guy just throwing out videos is helpful to anybody. I will tell you this, I will answer any question anybody asks me. And if it's something that I really don't feel like I have the best answer, I will try to lead them to that person uh, that I feel like can help them. You know, I feel like carving is all about people helping people. Uh, and, and for the most part, I, I have to say, I've been blessed to be around those kind of people uh, when it comes to wood carving. Uh, people ask me all the time, do I sell rough outs? No, I carve out of a two by two block of wood. Uh, there, there's not really much to do. Now I kind of create a rough out, which we'll get to uh, when, I, when I get started. Uh, this is what my block of two by two by seven will look like when I get ready to start uh, carving on a piece. And uh, we'll kind of get into that here in just a minute. Uh, people ask me, do you sand carvings? I say, absolutely not. I don't sand my carvings. Uh, 
uh, the guy I mentioned earlier, my dad's neighbor, uh, Delmer, told me, he goes, learn how to sharpen your tools and you won't need to sand. Uh, I don't know that I necessarily agree with that wholeheartedly, but I do know this. If you want a clean carving, make clean cuts. And, and I try to do that. I've tried to put that into my uh, my carvings uh, to where they, they do have good, clean, crisp cuts. Uh, how do you paint your carvings? Uh, this, this is one that's probably going to mess people up. But I look at painting my carvings kind of like coloring with crayons. Uh, when we were all kids growing up in school, we were taught that if you mix uh, red and yellow, you get orange. Or if you mix blue and yellow, you get green and so forth. I do a lot of that uh, where I, I, I maybe have a handful of paints uh, that I use uh, when I make my, when I do my faces. Uh, I'll use like a peach color, a little bit of a tan and a little bit of an off orange and mix that together for my flesh tones. I don't like uh, personally, I don't like any of the flesh colors out there, uh, especially if they're put on too strong. I feel like they they look plasticky or fake. Uh, most of us have some kind of coloring to us. Uh, so uh, I try to try to adapt based on that. Uh, I learned to paint in layers. Uh, if if I do that uh, mixture I was just talking about for my my skin tone, I will come back in and I will add uh, some uh, some, some light, uh, blushy color for the cheeks and the nose. Uh, I do a lot of hobos and things like that. And, uh, we all know hobos typically like to nip the bottle. So they get a little bit more blush on their nose and their cheeks. Uh, I do, uh, I'll go back in and I'll put a light, uh, really light wash of blue over the eyelids and, uh, the fingernails and things. If you're going to do a beard, uh, this guy that watching it off the day, don't forget I spit on him. Uh, you can see he's he's got the shadow, and that's because we went in and we uh, we mixed a little bit of uh, light blue. I might put just a touch of a hint of black in there, however deep I think it needs to be for the right look. So, kind of playing around. When I got into doing the stand shoot. Uh, Started doing something I had never done uh, other than like a belt buckle or something like that. And uh, I started using a lot of metallics. Uh, I'm a printer by trade. And uh, when metallic inks came out, they came out with colored metallics a few years ago. And I realized that uh, we can take silver or gold as a base and add whatever color we want to it and come up with a different color than gold or silver. So I've used that in my reds. I've used it in the greens. And what I find is if I do a, a thin enough wash, the color will soak down into the wood, but the metallic flakes will sit on the top and you get the sparkly, but you also get the color. And it's kind of a neat effect. If you guys are looking to try something different, it's a good way, it's a good way to go. Uh, I've also learned that if I'm working with a certain color that I want it to sit up on the wood a little bit more, if, if you know what I mean, it's like it's diving into the wood too much. Uh, I'll use uh, just plain white, put a little bit of white in that color, not enough to make a red go to a pink, but just enough to make it opaque so that it will set up on top of the wood. Uh, those are just different things that I that I try to do. So you carve animals. do I carve animals? Not unless I absolutely have to. Uh, I, I'll put in a little plug. When COVID came, my daughter's, uh, she's a NICU nurse. And when we couldn't go anywhere, uh, she decided to start carving, and uh, she she does a lot of bears, and she's done uh, some some of the rough outs uh, uh, from Moore and some of the other guys out there. And uh, she, I don't know if you guys remember the dog from uh, Helby. I can't remember what the little dog was that they did uh, spot or whatever it was. She's done a couple of those. Uh, I bought two uh, when they were discontinuing those because I thought, well, I'll sit down and carve one with her. She carved the first one, and then she carved mine. Uh, and she does good. There's certain things that people uh, adapt to quicker. Uh, you know, when I decide I'm going to do something, uh, like when uh, came time to do the Santas, uh, I started I started watching every everything I could on Facebook. I, I was fortunate enough to catch uh, when. Uh, Snow Cottage Carvings was on was on uh, 
uh, on here. And I love what Dave does. His, his snowmen are just fantastic. Uh, I love him. So I try to catch everything he, he posts just to see. Uh, Alex Joyner's another one. He's a young guy, but man, I'll tell you what, he's a fantastic carver. And I love the different things he comes up with. And then a while back, uh, Dave Stetson was on here. And he, if you all remember when he had all the different Santas laid out, uh, I'll go back to that video time and time again and just try to pick up on some of the ones that are in the background of things just to get ideals on different colorings and things like that. So, I mean, uh, the ideals are endless out there if you start looking. Hey, Mark, um, a few minutes ago, you talked about the show that you all have out there close to you. Yes. Um, your your internet kind of broke up a little bit. If you can go back through that and talk about that show that's right before uh, the okay. CCA meeting. Yeah, it's the Rain Tree Woodcarvers uh, show. It's in Muncie, Indiana. And it's at the fairgrounds and it's going to be September the 16th. And uh, we're fortunate enough because we're the week before uh, carving in the Rockies. And there's a lot of talent coming across the United States headed that way. Uh, this year, we're fortunate enough to have Jim Heiser in to uh, do a class, a two day, a two day class on Thursday and Friday prior to the show. And then he's going to hang around and, and judge our show. Uh, on Saturday. Uh, we also have Helvey Knives that's going to be setting up there. Uh, uh, DHK uh, will be uh, represented there as well. There's some uh, tool distributors that will be there. Uh, they have tools, books, a lot of things like that. Uh, it's a small one-day show, but it's, it's, a, it's a really good show. So if you're, if you're in the area, I would, would highly recommend it. And one more time, if you would, will you uh, talk a little bit about what you're auctioning off, what you have there, uh, yes. as far as the DHK knife? Talk about that again. Yeah. Uh, it, it is the uh, A handle. I call it the crescent moon handle. Uh, it's got a one and a half inch detail blade on it. Uh, these blades are very sharp. Uh, they hold a very good edge. Uh, I've used one now for a little over uh, probably a year uh, and a half now. Uh, they're, they're just good, durable knives, uh, and they come they come ready to cut uh, right out of the box. So, so we'll be taking bids on that through the end, that and the carving through the end of the meeting. And the carving one more time. Hey Mark, it's hey Mark, it's Doug Cooper. Hey, Doug, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Nice to talk to you. Yeah. Do you treat your carvings with anything before you paint? I do not. And, and I'm glad you asked that because that's one thing I forgot to mention. I get asked all the time, do you treat your carvings? I don't. Uh, I keep my carvings fairly clean when I carve. Uh, I don't use a lot of pencils. The, the, uh, the blocks here that I keep showing up of what I, they got more pencils on them than what I do when I carve them. Uh, those were for illustration. So I try to keep it clean. I just paint directly to the wood. And then I, I get asked all the time what my antiquing uh, method or technique is. I don't really tech, uh, I don't really antique. I'll show you real quick. I use uh, a water-based poly Minwax and I like it. I've used it for many, many years. And the reason that I use it is because it's it's safe. Uh, I don't have to worry about having a fire in my shop because I forgot to uh, take care of my rags or things of like like you do with certain certain products. Uh, you know, I'm lucky if I remember to my coffee pot off when I go in at night, so I don't want to worry about that kind of stuff. I like the way that the clearness of the of the uh, varnish brings the color out. Uh, so even if you have a, a, a fairly weak wash, it will still enhance the color a little bit. It's easy to clean. Uh, I have carvings that I carved way back in the very beginning, probably 25 years ago, uh, that are just as clear today as they were then. Uh, I personally don't like uh, the odor and the darkening of uh, doing the boil linseed oil. I know that's a real, real popular thing to do. Uh, if I go over to my personal collection, 
uh, of carvings where I've traded with people. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to trade with a lot of people. I love to trade uh, with people whenever there's an opportunity. And if I open those cabinet doors, man, the, the, the odor just knocks me down uh, from 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 the uh, from the wash. So that's kind of kind of what I do. I don't I don't pre-treat. I don't wash my carvings. I just paint directly after I finish carving. Thank you. And do you have yeah, a, well, a wood burning wood burning tip that you prefer? I do, and I, uh, I can grab it real quick if you can give me just a second. I have a couple that I do. I have one that's in the shape of a buttonhole, uh, so I don't have to worry about trying to do the uh, the buttons. Per day. This is a tip. I don't know if you guys can see that. Does that show up good enough? Yeah, hold it right there. That's good. I don't... Okay, that's the tip I use for just about everything. Uh, other than, like I said, I have one for buttons, and then I have, uh, if you look at the, the hobo, uh, in the beard of this hobo, you've got the little specks. I know a lot of guys will use a, a small V-tool or something to put those in. Uh, I have a tip here that is very fine, and I just get it hot, and I just poke those dots in, and then I have this one that I use to sign, you know, it's very kind of blurry. I don't know if it shows up, if you can get the gist of it or not, but uh, that's the one I use to sign uh, and number all of my carvings. Now, I will give you a little tip. I, I don't know who asked the question about the wood burner uh, tip, but what I do a lot of times, uh, how many of you have ever went to burn uh, some detail on a carving and you find that the, the lines are just too wide. You don't like that wide of a line. I will take this to my emery, just like I am a, like I do a knife and I will sharpen that thing up. Uh, I can literally cut the wood, but it gives me a fine line. So I, I you got to be careful because you do that over a period of time. You can get them thin and with the heating and cooling, uh, you, you can break your tip, but that's one thing I try to do uh, with almost every one of my tips that I use on a regular basis. Uh, I kind of hone them down to where they're they're a little bit thinner, so I can get uh, better control over my detail. If that makes sense. Uh, the one for buttons, uh, you can get these in all sizes. Uh, I don't know if that's going to show up. Let me try to get something that's. I don't know if that helps that show up or not any better. I'm trying to get it where you can see the hole. You know, there you go. Can you see that? It's basically, it's just basically a, a, a tube that's connected to the prods. Uh, and those come in all kinds of sizes. You can get them in big and small. Uh, you know, they do fish scales. They do all kinds of burning tips. Uh, I do try, I, I do recommend the fixed tips and, and not the interchangeable ones. Uh, I went through a couple of wood burners uh, with, with the uh, switchable tips. And after a while, they end up breaking loose. And, you know, and I not wood burn a lot. Uh, I have this guy uh, in, in the progression that we're going to work on just to show this is what I go to my paint table with. And I've just went in and I've just burned in the details uh, that I like to have. I try to accent uh, the beard, uh, the eyes, in the creases in the clothing and things like that. Any other questions? Mark, we're right at about four o'clock. Do you want to go to the progress uh, steps that you have there? Yeah, we can, and, and I'll do my best to to hurry as quick as I can because I know we talked a little bit longer than probably what we thought we might. I'm going to go ahead and make this switch with this camera. Hopefully, we get okay. Now, this is this is what. Which one are we going with? Yours. I think so. This one. Yeah. Okay, 
this is what my my what I would consider to be my rough out when I get ready to start carving. Uh, I'll draw a line for the hat. I just guess at where I want to put my my nose at. I start with my nose first, and I just use a a three eighths inch soft V to come in like this and just cut my nose first, and then I'll go up here to the hat. Uh, I'm not going to take the time today since we since we've ran out of time talking uh, to show you how to rough in these ears and things. Um, I'm sure Dave's video on roughing in the ears is probably still on uh, one of the pages out there. But once I get to this point, I'm ready to start putting in the details. And I got to determine uh, what is it that I'm going to make him be. I, I can turn him into a, into a hillbilly, uh, but he's not going to have, have a real good beard, so I may not do that. Uh, if I'm going to going to make him a hillbilly, I'll start his face down uh, quite a bit lower. Uh, I just did another face real quick just to show you. You can you can just alter these things by simply either adding a mustache or not having a mustache, and then uh, changing a face. I'm going to go ahead and show you how I how I start in here. I always do the sideburns first, and I'm not sure if if that's clear. But I just take, I have a, a 60 degree V tool. It's a flex cut. And I just kind of put the, uh, we'll go ahead and put the uh, sideburns in first. I do that because since I've got the ears already centered on my head based off of working on my corner. And I don't know uh, if you guys caught that. I'm gonna go ahead and back up here real quick. When I draw this in, you can see I still have the corner on the block and I just come straight up from that edge and make a line toward the top. And that's how I determine where my ear placement is going to be at. And that would be the front of my ears. And then once I have that in, my, my, my face is pretty well centered. I just kind of come in behind that and I'll make a cut with my knife. I like to, I like to use my V tools as kind of like a pencil to draw in my lines. Uh, I like the fact that it it kind of separates the wood and I don't have to worry about it splitting if I'm just trying to, to make a, a deep cut through there with my knife. So once I get the sideburns cut in, uh, from that point, I will go to the I will go to the eyes, and what I'll do is I'll just try to come over the same amount of space uh, from the sideburns on each side, still working toward the center of the of the nose, and I'm going to put this up here where I can actually hold on to it. I don't know if you guys can see this or not. I just cut this out to the nose, and I go all the way across. Uh, like I said, if somebody has a better way to do eyes. I'm always open, but this is just what I do. And it'll end up looking like this all the way across. I don't know if that's showing up or not there. And then what I do from that point is I complete, I'll finish out my nose. And where I've stopped, I'm going to cut right up into those eyes that I just cut in there. And I try to stop where I get that cut even with the eyelids. Then I just turn the thing around and I'll come around like that and make a cut. Now, this is how I'm going to end up making my eyes in my carving. Okay. That's what it's going to look like. Then I come back down here to the top of the, or to the bottom of the nose and just cut into that uh, cut there. And basically, it's creating what's going to be my eye cavity. And I can just flip it around, do the same thing to the other side. And I apologize if if this is too shaky or not real clear, but that's kind of what we end up with. Then I'll come in here and I'll split this because I want to have, have my eyebrows come in, my nose come up for my bridge. And then 
So that's that's basically where I'm at right now. And I'm going to take that same same V tool and just come up here between them. And now I have the separation of the eyes. A lot of times I'll end up kind of angling those back in underneath the hat a little bit more. And that's that's how I create my eyes. So then I'll I'll these after that I'll come back in here and just draw me a couple of eyes on there. And I'll just come in with a V tool, small V tool, and cut out my lines. And then I'll follow those same lines and make it deeper with my knife. Was that that soft V you used for the first cut on the eyes? Yes, sir. And I use the soft V a lot of times. I will, like when I do my nose or uh, even the eyes, I will use, I have two soft Vs that I like. One is a three eighths and the other one is a five eighths. And sometimes if I want those eyes to be, or the cheeks to be just up or down a little bit, I'll go to the bigger one and lean it one way or the other and just scoop a little bit wider hole. Same thing under the nose. If I decided, hey, I wanna have a, a different style of nose or something, I'll go in with a bigger soft V and make it. So there's there's the eye. I know it's it's kind of rough. Uh, I wanted to go ahead and show, show how I do my hands real quick if I can. That's my hand roughed out. Uh, I'm going to bring this into here just a little bit. Apparently, the dog's deciding that he wants to be in the middle of everything. Then, this was one of the things that became very key for me. Uh, this is a number seven. When Before you start cutting your fingers in, come back in and put a couple of these grooves in here that create your knuckles and stuff. And then uh, this is something that uh, I don't have to count fingers as much as I used to. Uh, I learned this from, from Dwayne. If you come into the very center, you can already see the thumb here. I'm gonna go ahead and cut that thumb in real quick so, so that you can see what I'm talking about, just so that there's a little bit of, okay. So now we see the thumb. One of the things that he pointed out to me, and I'll, I'll draw it on so that it that it is it shows up better, is start in the very center and then split that and split this. And that's been very helpful for me, not having to worry about not counting fingers and getting the fingers spaced. And then I just come back down in here with the V tool. And I've got the start of my fingers. And then I'll go back in with another small V tool and I'll put in fingernails and wrinkles and things like that in the hand. As far as the mouth goes, I don't know if you guys can see the mouth. I went ahead. If I'm going to have it like a hobo where he's smoking a cigar, I go ahead and drill the, the hole in there. Then I'll take a small V and make the shape of what I want. And then I'll come back in with my knife and just kind of define that a little bit better and do a cut to where my teeth are coming up into the top of the mouth. And then the same thing at the bottom. And now we have a guy that's got some teeth in him. If that makes sense. Anybody have any any questions or anything? We did have one question about um, how many coats of um, your, I guess, polyurethane that you put on at the end. Yes, I put one coat on. 
Now, there is a trick to it. Uh, if you put it on too heavy, it can look milky. I've had people go, well, have you used that? It makes your carving look milky. Uh, I, you know how you dry brush white paint on? Uh, I'll kind of use the same technique when I use it. Uh, I won't just saturate my brush. I just get the tip of it in, and then I just brush it in uh, to where it's smooth and uniform across there. And I do one coat. I've never done more than one coat. Uh, the thing that I do like about that type of uh, uh, varnish or uh, polyurethane is you can get it in flat or matte. Uh, I like the flat because it doesn't make my carvings look plastic when they're done. It still gives it a little bit of a shine. You'll pick up a little bit of light reflection, but it doesn't look plastic. Uh, one other thing I'm going to go to real quick is... One of, the, one of the other things I've been asked a lot since I did the uh, came out with these uh, hat, tree hat Santas, uh, that was purely by just accident. My, my daughter was on the other side of, uh, of me carving, and I had cut out a two-sided Santa uh, where one side was a, a Christmas tree and the other side was a, was a Santa. And I was working on it, trying to come up with a Santa uh, with a big, tall, pointy hat, and it just hit me. It's like, why not put a tree on his head? So that's what I did. Uh, I get asked all the time, how do you how do you do these uh, Santa trees? So I thought I would go ahead and do a quick demonstration on that if we got time. Yeah, go right ahead. We've got time. Okay, so what I do, as you can see, I've already started the one. I will cut in. I'll go around with my with my soft V again. You'll find out I like soft Vs. Uh, I'll go around and, and make the different tiers of the tree. And then from the from the bottom of that tier, I will cut it in at an angle up to here. And then I don't worry about, I don't want it smooth. Uh, I'll try to make some cuts deeper and just not, not uniform. So when I come back in, and I'm going to come in here and I'm just going to make a, a cut in and I'm just going to do this number. And then I'll come right up beside that and just make a straight cut. Are we on there? Okay, there we go. And, and I kind of cut that out of there like so. It's just a step and repeat uh, type process. And I come over here to this side, cut it out of there. And then as you begin to walk around the tree, uh, the only thing you want to try to do is break up your pattern. Uh, don't, get, don't get caught to where you have the same pattern. You see, I started this one here where I have a V from the top tier. So I started a straight one there. <clears throat> then I'm going to come up here a little bit shorter, uh, not quite so deep, and the same thing. You'll find that your this section of the tree will continue to get smaller as you go down because you're going to continually cut uh, into it. So once I get with that, and I try to, I try to break it up to where uh, some of them are um, wider than others so that there's just you're just trying to break up the uniformity to where it's not uh, I, identically the same and I just keep walking around the tree like that all the way around until I get down to the bottom tier and then just repeat the process again and if anybody has any kind of questions uh, about anything I've talked about today feel free uh, to get a hold of me anytime like I said, I may not have the best answers, uh, but I will do my best to get you in touch with the person that would have the best answer. So I do, do want to say I appreciate uh, Blake and Dave giving me the opportunity to be here. Uh, I personally consider this one of the greatest privileges I've had in my wood carving experience uh, with being allowed to be on here. And I do appreciate that, guys. Well, thank you, Mark. Um... I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and fill in the blanks as far as um, what somebody's asking here about where they can find you. Uh, you sent me that they can find you on Facebook. Um, you also have an M.A. Dillinger Wood Carvings Facebook page. Uh, they can find you on Etsy at Mad uh, Dillinger Carvings. Uh, they can find you on Instagram at Dillinger163. Uh, and they can also email you at madwoodcarver200 at hotmail.com. Correct. Uh, I will post all of those links in the uh, 
in the YouTube video when we post that out there probably tomorrow. Um, and that way everybody can come in and kind of see where they can find you or find your work. Uh, I encourage you all to go out and check out his stuff on Etsy and uh, you see anything out there that you like, go ahead and uh, purchase that. Uh, I have one of his trees here that uh, he's done. Uh, you can see the finished product there as far as what all he's done uh, and the amount of work that goes into doing something like that. So uh, very fantastic carvings. Uh, Mark, I appreciate you coming on and sharing with us. Uh, Mark and I are doing a trade, so I've got to uphold my end of the deal and get him uh, some carvings out there. I agree with you, Mark. Trading carvings is probably the best thing uh, that you can do with another carver, uh, especially uh, if you want to encourage them to, uh, to continue carving. So try to reach out and do that if you can. Uh, we'll get all that squared away at the end. Um, I want to remind you all again about the CCA Carving the Rockies show. It's coming up in September. If you haven't gone out to the CCA website, I encourage you all to go out there and check out the offerings. I know there's classes that are available. There's a social on Saturday night. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities. If you're planning on going out there, you need to get signed up for some of those things. Uh, so make sure you go over and check out the uh, Caricature Carvers of America uh, website. You can just Google that and it should come up there and check out the show information. Again, uh, Mark, I want to say thank you for coming on. Uh, thank you all for joining us every Saturday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, next week, we'll have Lucas Cost on. If I remember correctly, Lucas is working on a big project that he wants to share with everybody. Uh, so next week may be a great one to tune into. So uh, having said all of that, uh, we'll see you all next Saturday, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And uh, thank you again for joining us. I started the recording, but don't worry about it. We're in no rush because I'll edit everything. Okay. <laughs> I just did that to make sure I was recording so Blake doesn't make fun of me again. No. Oh, I'll make fun of you recording. I know you will. something to put at the end. <laughs> what do you think? Just get my ego deflate. That's a good yeah, thing. A little, a little blooper action. Yep. <laughs> okay. All right, Mark. Are you ready to do this? We can run okay. through it anytime no. you want, man. You no. can't lean that way, though. No, but well, I guess they can hear me whether I lean into the microphone or not. Uh, we're coming to you today uh, with the International Woodcarvers Association on uh, May the uh, 13th. We forgot Everything to say well. excellent, except for International Association of Woodcarvers. So now you get what, what did I say? I don't know, did but I you got to redo that? it. You, you gave, you gave the, the thing everybody international. Um, well, I won't even say it because I'll start screwing myself up. Okay. It's it's my fault. Fault. Say, and what, is he supposed to say welcome? welcome yeah, just to say welcome to the International Association of Woodcarvers. Okay, ready? Okay. On May 13th. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I laughed. <laughs> well, and it, you got everything except for the wood the name. Uh, wood carvers. <laughs> it's wood carvers. What am I saying? Wood carving. <laughs> it's oh that's because I'm reading. Right. Hey, I tell you what, hey, Mark, Mark, if you yeah. want, just look at it and say International Association of Woodcarvers, and then I will edit, um, I will edit the audio into there. So it says International Association of Woodcarvers when you're saying woodcarving, and nobody will notice the difference. <laughs>